Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 1967 movie, Bonnie and Clyde. And joining us to help separate fact from fiction is author, historian, and emperor of the Western world, John Neal Phillips. (laughs) I'll explain that last one at the end of this episode. During his career, John has interviewed a lot of people close to the events that took place, from witnesses all the way to members of the Barrel Gang itself. His book, Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The Ten Fast Years of Ralph Foltz, details the story from the perspective of Ralph Foltz, who was a part of the gang. He also interviewed Blanche Barrow and edited her memoir called My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. Blanche was Clyde's sister-in-law and ran with Bonnie and Clyde for an incredibly tense three-month part of their crime spree. Before we connect with John, though, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Clyde always drove carefully so he wouldn't draw the attention of the police. Number two, around the time of the ambush, Clyde's cover in Louisiana was as a lumberjack. Number three, Bonnie and Clyde's favorite weapon of choice was the Browning automatic rifle. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Oh, and if you haven't had the chance, I would highly recommend checking out my last chat with John about the movie The Highwaymen because he was the consultant for that movie, and that movie covers the law's side of things, trying to catch Bonnie and Clyde. For now, it's time to learn more about what it was like for the Barrow Gang as we chat with John Neal Phillips about the historical accuracy of Bonnie and Clyde. The movie opens by showing how Bonnie and Clyde meet. It seems to be sort of a chance meeting when she catches Clyde stealing Bonnie's mother's car in 1931. The two end up walking into town together, and almost immediately, we can tell that she's smitten by him. Right away, we see the two committing a crime. It happens, uh, Bonnie asks Clyde what armed robbery is like, and Clyde shows Bonnie his gun, and she doesn't believe that he's actually going to use it. So, to prove her wrong, he walks across the street to a place called, I think, Rich Groceries is, is what it's called in the movie. And a couple minutes later, he emerges with a small stack of cash. They run into a nearby car, Clyde jumpstarts it, and they drive away. How well does the movie do showing how Bonnie and Clyde first met? Not very well at all, historically speaking. But that's a great scene. It really is. The, the way it's shot, the way it's acted, the way it's written. And I, I love the way Warren Beatty uh, has that little bit with the toothpick in his mouth when he's showing her the gun. I really like this movie. It's fun to watch. It's not at all historically (laughs) accurate, though. Uh, The way uh, uh, Bonnie and Clyde met, and uh, stick with me because this this gets a little convoluted, but there was a, a kid named Clarence Clay who was a friend of Clyde Barrows, a real close friend of Clyde Barrows. And Clarence had a sister named Edith. And Edith married Hubert Parker, who was Bonnie's brother. And uh, Hubert and Edith lived at 105 Herbert Street down in West Dallas uh, with Edith's parents. And Clarence Clay, her brother, lived there as well. So uh, apparently uh, Edith had been in some kind of accident, broken her arm, and needed some help around the house there. And Bonnie came over to help one time and and to visit with her brother and sister-in-law. And it so happened that Clarence Clay and Clyde Barra showed up at the house. And by all accounts, Bonnie and Clyde were immediately attracted to each other. But uh, there there was no uh, attempt to steal Bonnie's mother's car. For one thing, Bonnie's mother did not have a car. She didn't have enough money to own a car. And uh, as I remember in the movie, that house is a two-story house. There are very few two-story buildings at all that date from that time in West Dallas. The the homes, many of them are the old-style shotgun houses, 
very quickly built because they were meant to be temporary, but uh, people stayed down there for a long time. But yeah, the way Bonnie and Clyde, uh, that, that scene in the movie is very fanciful, but it's, that's not how they met at all. It sounds like the two parts they, they kind of pulled from was that it was more of a chance encounter and she fell for him right away. But then the rest of it is kind of filled in. True. Yeah. Much of the movie is like that. They do pull the essence of most of the incidents and then uh, rearrange uh, some things. They, they also conflate a few things uh, for time reasons. Uh, but yeah, you're right about that. According to the movie, after a farmer named Otis Harris says that his place was repossessed by the bank and Bonnie and Clyde are there and they shoot up the house and Clyde tells Otis that they rob banks. And the way that it's shown in the movie, it really sounded to me like Clyde is just kind of making this up as a way of making Otis feel better that the bank has screwed over Otis's family. And so Clyde is going to give him some payback. But then a little bit later, we see Bonnie and Clyde robbing their first bank nearby Farmer State Bank. Was that how and why they started robbing banks? No, not at all. But that scene, again, really captures the public mood at the time. Much of the public held responsible for the economic situation at the time, uh, banks, politicians, and the law for some reason. A lot of people had the feeling that the law was on the take and that they were being paid off by wealthy bankers and wealthy politicians. And, and there probably was some of that, but there was a general feeling that all lawmen were on the take, you know. So it was bankers, politicians, and lawmen, and anybody that could ruin their day was okay. So th that scene really captures that. But uh, actually, Clyde did not like robbing banks. Uh, he did it very reluctantly. And only because uh, somebody else needed something in the way of a lot of money real quick. Ralph Fultz, uh, one of the members of the original incarnation of the Barrow Gang, uh, he and Raymond Hamilton and Clyde Barrow robbed a bank in Lawrence, Kansas, because they wanted to get a lot of money to recruit some uh, other outlaws to go raid East Ham Prison Farm. And th that was the first bank robbery any of them had pulled. Um, they learned how to do it in prison from bank robbers that they knew in prison. And the bank robbers told them tricks of the trade and uh, uh, what weapons to use, how to act, what time of day to go in. Uh, the, the bank robbers that taught them how to do this, uh, their technique was to case the bank for two or three days and uh, see who arrives first in the morning and then whoever it is that arrives first, get the drop on them and, and take them in before anybody else shows up in the bank, make them open up the vault and then clear out before the bank even opens. That, that was the technique. And that's what they did at Lawrence, Kansas. After that, Clyde did not like robbing banks because it made headlines and he did not like headlines because it made him hot. Of course, uh, uh, he still got hot anyway because of all the chances he took, but he did not like robbing banks. After Buck joined up uh, accidentally there in Missouri, Buck was interested in bank robbing. So the two of them pulled a few bank jobs. About half of them actually worked, but it was only because of Buck. Uh, that he, After Buck and Blanche were out of the picture, there are no bank robberies attributed to, well, there's one in, in Missouri. Clyde and two other guys pulled off one bank robbery that we know of. And then after that, it was just all gas stations and grocery stores. He didn't like robbing banks. That's the exact opposite impression I got walking away from that first part, that first scene there, even though, you know, good scene. But when they robbed that bank, uh, they find out that, oh, we went out of business a few weeks earlier. So they really, they get almost nothing out of it, which just tells me that there really wasn't any planning. It just seemed to be spur of the moment. And they didn't really care about how much money they got out of it because they didn't really seem to plan <laughs> that one in that scene. Yeah, uh, th th that kind of thing did happen. Uh, R Ralph told me that on his own, uh, in a spur of the moment, usually Ralph cased everything he did, uh, you know, really checked it out for a long time. But he, he was desperate and needed something. And on the spur of the moment, he 
went in and tried to rob a bank that, that was an insurance company. Now, it still said bank on the outside, but he walked in and everybody just kind of looked at him with a blank <laughs> look. You know, this isn't a bank anymore. This is an insurance company. <laughs> and and uh, Raymond Hamilton told his brother Floyd that the same thing happened to him. Clyde's mother, who uh, started to write a book and uh, only left uh, an unfinished manuscript, uh, in that unfinished manuscript, she says, Clyde, that did happen to Clyde, that he tried to rob a bank that had gone out of business. And that's not surprising. You know, 5,000 U.S. banks closed in 1932 alone, just in that one year. So there are a lot of empty bank buildings <laughs> at the time. But now, after the East Ham raid, because of a deal that had been made with one of the people that helped them pull the raid off, Clyde and the escapees went on this bank robbing spree all across the Midwest. I mean, all across the Plains states. Uh, they hit two banks in Iowa, but all, all to pay off this one guy. He, he was promised $5,000. And that was the quickest way to get him paid off and get him out of the picture there. But after that was over with uh, Clyde stayed away from banks. He hated doing that. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, uh, if, if go back to the movie, the first time that we see somebody joining Bonnie and Clyde is an attendant at a gas station named C.W. Moss. And sort of like how we saw Bonnie kind of egging on Clyde to use the gun when they first met this time, it's Clyde who kind of starts egging on C.W., asking if he has what it takes to pull bank jobs. And so when C.W. says that he does, Clyde asks him to prove it. So he walks, uh, C.W. walks into the gas station there, grabs all the money out of the register, tosses it to Bonnie, then he hops in, and all of a sudden, now there's three people in the gang. How well does the movie do showing the way that Bonnie and Clyde recruited C.W. Moss? Again, not well at all. <laughs> Sensing a trend. <laughs> but, uh, for, first of all, there was no C.W. Moss. That character is a composite of two different people. The early part of the film, all the way up to uh, the point where Buck and Blanche uh, get captured, that C.W. Moss character is actually a fella named W.D. Jones, who was 16 at the time and running with them. He was in all the major gun battles there. And after that last gun battle where Buck and Blanche uh, were captured, uh, W.D. Jones decided this is a little too exciting for me. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, retire for a while. <laughs> and he just disappeared. Uh, later, he was arrested down in Houston. Uh, the latter part of the film is uh, after Buck and Blanche are out of the picture there. Uh, that C.W. Moss character is based on a guy named Henry Methvin. And Henry Methvin, uh, M-E-T-H-V-I-N, Methvin, uh, he's one of the ones that was broken out of East End Prison Farm by Bonnie and Clyde in January of 1934. And he wound up putting Bonnie and Clyde on the spot over in Louisiana, he and his father. And his mother was involved, too. Uh, so uh, uh, C.W. Moss is two characters jammed together. And W.D. Jones w lived in West Dallas. Uh, the Joneses and the Barrows had known each other for a long time. They both arrived in Dallas County at about the same time, and they both uh, lived in a free campground underneath one of the bridges over the Trin Trinity River. And got to know each other then. And uh, W.D. Jones, he was much younger than Clyde and, and just kept pestering Clyde to take him out with him. You know, he, he just wanted to get out of town. And so the first Clyde finally said, OK, jump in. The first time out, they kill a guy. And so W.D. is just kind of stuck with him, you know. OK, yeah, we see we almost see that happening because soon after, well, it's C.W. Moss in the movie, but soon after that. He's the getaway driver, and as they're trying to escape from a man from the bank that they just robbed, hops onto the car, and Clyde shoots him in the face. And that's the first time we see them uh, killing somebody in the movie. So it sounds like that part of it they kind of pulled from history. Yes, the, in fact, the the details of that killing actually are pulled from the actual killing, which uh, occurred on Christmas Day, nineteen thirty two. Uh, W.D. Jones was really good at stealing cars. That, that was one reason why Clyde 
took him along with him because he was really good at stealing cars. And uh, so they were in Temple, Texas, and uh, uh, saw this car parked in front of this house. And W.D. Jones got out, and uh, and then Clyde got out, and, and Bonnie took their car and went around the corner to wait for him. And Clyde and W.D. both slip into this this car, and uh, the owner of the car sees them doing it. Comes running out of the house, and he jumps on the running board as they're driving away, and he's and Clyde, it appears, is the one that was behind the wheel, and uh, which makes sense. He he usually liked to drive, uh, so he probably was the one behind the wheel. And uh, this man reached in and started choking him. And uh, uh, Clyde said more than once, turn me loose or I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you. And uh, he didn't turn him loose, so Clyde shot him in the neck, and he died the next morning. Real nice, great Christmas Day event. And after all of that, they left the car. They figured the car was too hot, so they just jumped back in the old car and took off. So into the day, it was pointless. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Wow. Well, you uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier, and the next time we see somebody joining the gang in the movie, it's uh, Clyde's brother Buck and Blanche. And the way the movie sets this up, it starts when Buck and Blanche join the other three for what Clyde calls a vacation to Missouri. They're going to find a place to hole up and basically because nobody's looking for them there. So they're in Joplin, Missouri, and there's the five in the barrel gang inside a house. And then all of a sudden, police car blocks their driveway. Blanche starts screaming when she hears that the law is outside. A few seconds later, Clyde starts shooting at the cops who return fire, and it just turns into this huge shootout. They do end up getting out. Uh, Clyde it's driving and he rams police car to be able to get out. Others are in the car. Everybody except for Blanche, she kind of catches and, and uh, screaming and running away and manages to, to catch up uh, later on. Uh, but that's how the movie shows this happening with uh, Buck and Blanche joining and then this big shootout in Missouri. Is that Did that really happen? Oh, yeah, that did happen in March 1933. And the, the elements of the way uh, the movie portrays that the elements, most of them are pretty spot on. People who are into this sort of thing will notice that the weapons are all wrong. Uh, Clyde never used a Thompson machine gun because at the time they were very unreliable. They would jam real easy. And he knew that uh, he preferred the Browning automatic rifle, which they had had a, a box full of those in that apartment. And it's true, uh, one of the police cars blocked the garage door. They were living in a garage apartment behind the house uh, of the owner of the garage apartment. They'd been there a while, and they hadn't been trying to conceal the fact that they were there. That Clyde and Buck were up late at night partying, you know, uh, uh, playing cards and drinking beer. beer. Beer had just been legalized after Prohibition. And so they had bought some beer. Uh, Buck really liked to drink. Clyde actually didn't like to drink much. He didn't even like to drink coffee. But uh, when when he was with his brother, he'd become somebody else. So Blanche was kind of nervous about this. In her book, you can see that she's nervous about it. They're making so damn much noise that she's afraid that the neighbors are going to call the police. And that's exactly what happened. The neighbors complained that there were these rowdy people living in this garage apartment. So the the police showed up and uh, blocked the garage door, just like they showed in the movie. Uh, Bonnie and Blanche were upstairs. W.D. Jones, Buck, and Clyde were down in the garage when that car pulled up, and uh, they started shooting immediately. I think it was Buck went to close the garage door and one of the officers in the car jumped out to try and block uh, him closing that door. And and either Clyde or Buck killed him right there with a shotgun blast. And then everybody started shooting. The problem was the police ran out of ammunition pretty quick, and which wasn't a problem for Buck and Clyde and W.D. Jones. They they had robbed a, a National Guard armory. And they had thousands of rounds of ammunition. They had uh, three or four Browning automatic rifles and over 50, 45 caliber Colt pistols, you know. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. And they they had gas masks and uh, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, 
the plan always was if the police ever showed up, everybody get to the car. So as soon as Blanche and Bonnie heard the shooting, they ran down to the car. Blanche had a dog named Snowball with them. And she had trained Snowball to run to the car on command. So she had told Snowball, run to the car. And Snowball ran down the stairs uh, into the garage. And then Bonnie Bonnie and Blanche came right after. Bonnie jumped into the car. But before Blanche jumped in the car, Clyde asked her to help him push that police car out of the way. And this is probably, uh, Blanche uh, relays this story. But it's also corroborated by the coroner's inquest. Uh, the witnesses saw a man and a woman pushing the police car across the street. They put, it, it was on an incline. They got it started, and it went right across the street and into a yard across the street. And Blanche said that she, her sweater got caught on the bumper and pulled her all the way across the street there, and that's corroborated in that inquest also. But then she got her sweater undone. She went back to the garage uh, and uh, Buck was waiting for her out in the street shooting at the police officers who by then had run out of ammunition. But Clyde and WD and uh, Buck didn't know that. So they just kept shooting at the police officers. They had killed two police officers at that point. And they were both laying in front of that garage door. Uh, Blanche goes back into the garage, gets into the car and notices her dog is not in the car. So she gets back out of the car and just calmly walks out of the garage and starts walking down the street looking for her dog. This is corroborated in the police inquiry too, the coroner's uh, inquiry also. Uh, One of the officers testified that all of a sudden they saw a woman. They didn't know where she came from, but she was just calmly walking down the street calling to someone. And she was calling her dog Snowball. And, uh, of course, that's portrayed in the movie that Blanche freaked out and started screaming, running down down the street. I asked I asked Blanche, what did you think about that? And she said, she said, that movie made me look like a screaming horse's ass. (laughs) That was Blanche. That was the real Blanche. Blanche wasn't a shrinking violet at all. She wasn't anything the way. Estelle Parsons portrays her in the movie, which she portrays her beautifully. I I love all the performances in that movie, but uh, they're not accurate at all. Uh, Blanche uh, told me she was there because she wanted to be there. She said, I was young and stupid, and and, uh, Clyde Barrow never held a gun to my head. I was there because I wanted to be there. And that's the way she said it, too. And she, she was involved in the robberies and everything all the way down the line. She was a tough cookie. A lot different than this Tell Parsons portrayal of her. Yeah, so uh, then uh, Clyde gets the the car out of the garage and uh, turns down the street looking for Blanche and then uh, finds her down at, down at the corner. And she just gets in the car and they drive off. And they drove straight to Texarkana and robbed a filling station in Texarkana. Bonnie still had her nightgown on. And, and it, was, it was about 40 degrees uh, Blanche remembers being super cold in that car. Oh, uh, uh, Clyde had been shot superficially. Uh, a, a bullet had glanced off the button of, of his silk shirt, which he was really proud of his silk shirt, and he was pissed off, really, really mad that he his button had gotten damaged and there was blood on this shirt. But W.D. Jones got hit pretty bad. He had a through-and-through shot uh, through the shoulder. And uh, he was in a lot of pain on the way to Texarkana. W.D. Jones tells this story uh, uh, years later. He said uh, he kept complaining. He thought he had been shot twice. And Clyde kept saying, no, that's a, that's a one shot. It's through and through. You're, you're going to be all right. No, I was shot twice. And so to prove it, Clyde stopped the car, went out in the woods and cut a hickory branch that was straight enough and wrapped gauze around it and poured peroxide over it and just rammed it through that hole just to show him that it was a through-and-through shot. Man, these are some tough people. (laughs) Man, it's amazing they lived as long as they did. I have to ask, you mentioned the armory that they had robbed there, and I actually have a friend in in Enid, Oklahoma, who mentioned that there were rumors that Bonnie and Clyde were responsible for robbing an armory. Was that where it was? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so that that was the armory, and there are a few. The movie doesn't really show that, but there are a few little mentions here and there. Like I think there's some references in the dialogue to an armory, and we see it at one point later on in the movie. We see C. W. Moss grabbing grenades from what looks like a military box. Like you know, so obviously they've 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 got some weapons there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just don't explain where they came from. Yeah. Well, after the shootout in Missouri, the movie shows bon- Bonnie's blaming Blanche for alerting the cops because she was screaming. And then later on, Bonnie gets upset when Blanche asks for her share of the take. Was there any sort of bad blood between Blanche and Bonnie? I wouldn't call it bad blood, but there was a rivalry between the two of them. And, and it was uh, it didn't have anything to do with money. It didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, the police or anything like that. Uh, it, it was that they were both uh, attractive. They liked to wear uh, really hot, expensive clothes, and uh, they wanted to outdo each other. And they, they were trying to outdo each other as the, the most hip, fashionable woman on the road that day. You know, the way Blanche put it years later was she said uh, it, it was a situation where there were two cooks in the same kitchen. That's the way she put it. And you just can't have two cooks in the same kitchen. So they, they, they frequently were at each other's throats, but there were extenuating circumstances, too. I mean, their lives were uh, pretty miserable, <laughs> you know, by choice, of course. But uh, th- their lives were just long periods of absolute boredom, always looking over your shoulder, punctuated by sheer terror, moments of sheer terror. When Buck was finally uh, captured and he was being interviewed before he died, one of the uh, interviewers asked him, how many gunfights have you been in? And he said, about one every week. So there's a lot of them out there we don't even know about that they were involved in. Wow. Wow. When uh, we talked a lot about the highwaymen, you mentioned that Clyde Barrow was a fan of Jesse James. And if I recall from history, Jesse James kind of liked seeing himself in the newspapers and dime novels. But then earlier you're mentioning that Clyde didn't like bank robberies because it made him hot. Uh, was was he not? Uh, did he not like the attention that started to gather? I'm sure after the shootout in Missouri, it only you know expanded even further beyond that. Yeah. After that shootout in Missouri, because it came on so quick, they had to leave everything behind. Bucks parole papers were left behind. Uh, His marriage license to Blanche was left behind and several unprocessed rolls of film that had very clear photographs of them were left behind. Several of Bonnie's poems were left behind. So the the authorities knew exactly who this was. This is the first time that uh, uh, the Barrow brothers could be absolutely pinpointed to a particular crime. And uh, Clyde didn't like any of that. Now, he, he wanted to stay out of the paper as much as possible, because as soon as you started making headlines, you started getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and it was harder to exist. So when the cops showed up there initially, they they didn't know who, who it was there. No, they didn't even know. It. OK, it was a noise complaint. and They just showed up and then. OK, OK. Yeah, the the uh, the search warrant was to search for illegal liquor. Uh, they, they thought they had bootleggers in the place, which made sense because they were bringing in a lot of beer into the place, mostly for Buck. But Buck liked hard liquor, too, so they were probably in contact with some bootlegger in the area because uh, that was still illegal. Uh, any hard liquor was still illegal. Uh, hard liquor and wine, just beer was legal. So, the, yeah, the search warrant was, was for – it was a liquor warrant is what it was. They didn't, they didn't have any idea. Yeah, they didn't have any idea who they had there. Yeah, the impression I got in the movie, because I think I don't remember how many cars there were, but there's more than one police car that shows up. Like there's there's multiples that start showing up. Yeah, there were two. Yeah. So I got the impression that they knew that they were on to something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were two. I, I think there were six officers. And they were, and the reason why, the main reason why there were six officers was be, is because Joplin crosses two county jurisdictions. And so that, and that house, that garage apartment was in one county, uh, but the police station was in the other county. So they actually had to get uh, the uh, county constable to serve the warrant uh, because uh, it was out of uh, the Joplin, Joplin police 
uh, jurisdiction. And there were two uh, Missouri State patrolmen involved there, too. All of them ran out of ammunition, uh, uh, except for the ones that were killed right away. You mentioned the film roles, and this, and there's a big picture, a picture that plays a big part, I should say, in the movie. And this happens when Frank Hamer sneaks up on them. And Clyde shoots the gun out of Hamer's hand. They're, they're still in Missouri. This is a, after that. So obviously it wouldn't have been a picture they found <laughs> in, in the house there. But uh, Clyde notices that this is a, a Texas Ranger and they decide to take a picture. There's a picture of Bonnie kissing Frank Hamer that ends up making it into newspapers and uh, with the Im- impression that, according to the movie, Clyde wants to embarrass the Texas Rangers. Did that happen? No, not at all. That, that Texas Ranger, by the way, played by Denver Pyle, he, he played that so well. That, that actor, he, he could play anything. He, he's, he, he could play comedy, you know, to the T. He, he's in a lot of episodes of the Andy Griffith show, you know. Uh, and uh, But then uh, he could play dramatic roles, too, and he really plays this vindictive, nasty creature in, in that movie. And he plays it so well, and it's really well written, but it never happened. It never happened. Uh, the first time Frank Hamer ever saw Bonnie and Clyde was the morning he shot them. He didn't know. He didn't even know what they looked like. It was the two two Dallas uh, officers that were there mainly to identify Bonnie and Clyde, and make sure they weren't shooting some farmer that's driving up. They weren't able to identify them from the film roll that they film rolls that they got in the. No, not 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 positively you, you, you know it's very difficult you know you, you do see in movies you, you'll see uh, some uh, outlaws in hiding somewhere and uh, the newspapers start printing photographs of you know put yourself in the position of somebody just walking down the street are you going to think this guy passing you on the street is this person in in the newspaper you know unless they've got a great big scar across their face or they got a big sign that says i'm the one you're looking for you know? it's just not going to happen you know and uh, the, those photos as as good as they are they they just aren't quite good enough to be darn sure when you're getting ready to kill somebody they they wanted to make darn sure this was Bonnie and Clyde not somebody else, you know, because they darn near killed somebody else in Louisiana at one, at one point, just barely stopped opening fire uh, when they realized uh, that, that uh, they were going to hit the wrong people. Oh, like a misidentification? Well, well uh, not exactly. Uh, they had Bonnie and Clyde in their sights in a place called Castor, Louisiana, and they were really set to open up on them, but there were people around, lots of people around. And uh, uh, earlier uh, in November 1933, uh, here in Dallas County, there was an attempt to kill Bonnie and Clyde on uh, what's now called Airport Freeway. And one of the bullets uh, traveled a mile and entered a farmhouse and hit a woman inside the house. And so that was that, the two Dallas officers were in that ambush that day. And they remembered that. So when they were over in Louisiana, they wanted to make darn sure nobody else was around. Also, they wanted to make sure there were no witnesses to this thing because there wasn't going to be any attempt to arrest them. They were just going to shoot them. That was it from the start. In the movie, we see the Barrow Gang kidnapping a couple, and they're called uh, Eugene Grizzard and Velma Davis in the movie. And they're all driving along in one car. But before long, Buck starts cracking jokes with Eugene and Velma. It's almost no time at all before, according to the movie's timeline, you would just assume that they were friends. Like, you never know that they just kidnapped the other. They're laughing together. Uh, They get food. Uh, As they're eating, Bonnie asks what Eugene does. He says he's an undertaker. And then immediately she turns around and says, get them out of here. So Eugene and Velma are dropped at the side of the road. Are there any accounts like this where people were kidnapped by the Barrow Gang and Oh, I almost ended up becoming friends with them so quickly. The abduction of people was a common practice with uh, Clyde for a number of reasons, just to prevent them from contacting authorities before they could get out of the area, to disorient a victim, uh, especially police. That more than once, they kidnapped police who had stumbled across them and uh, driven them 
uh, dr- uh, th- then they would drive the police officer a thousand miles away and leave him by the side of the road with, with a few bucks to take the bus home. And, and the officer wouldn't know where the hell they are. They usually leave them out in the middle of nowhere between a couple of towns uh, on a main road. So they'd be found, but uh, with a couple of bucks for the bus ride home. But that was it. Yeah, usually there was no love loss between <laughs> between the, the victims and, and uh, the perpetrators there, a- except for one time. Um, there was this uh, nasty shooting uh, up in uh, northeastern Oklahoma between Miami and Commerce, Oklahoma. And this one constable was killed and a city marshal was abducted. And the city marshal had been wounded uh, superficially. He had a flesh wound on, on his uh, temple. But he was abducted and they drove him all the way to Missouri. And along the way, uh, this city marshals uh, started to kind of like Bonnie and Clyde. Henry Methvin was with them, too. But Henry Methvin never said a word the whole time, this guy said. So he couldn't get a fix on him. But uh, he talked a lot with Bonnie and Clyde. He he really grew kind of fond of Bonnie because she she was uh, uh, very friendly, uh, joked a lot. And, And Clyde was very taciturn and he was really upset because of the, the shooting and the messy way they had to get away and that this guy's still in the car with them. But uh, they let him out up in Missouri. They let him out, gave him a few bucks for the ride home. And uh, he, uh, this marshal told the newspapers, he said, Clyde Barrow, oh, he is the coolest operator I've ever known. He kind of had this respect for uh, Barrow. I don't know if that lasted or not, but at the moment, he was kind of in awe of Clyde Barrow, and he really liked Bonnie a lot. Couldn't get a fix on the other guy. But the the part in uh, the movie, Bonnie and Clyde, the Grizzard character, you know, is played by uh, Gene Wilder. It's beautiful, you know. Uh, I actually interviewed Sophie Stone is the woman's real name. They changed the names of those two characters because both of those people were still alive when that movie was made and they didn't want any problems you know <laughs> it was it was hard and you know blanche was still alive so it was hard enough using her name in the thing they paid her off for it but they showed her a different script ahead of time and she said when the movie came out she didn't recognize anything it, it was all strange. yeah so so, uh, and, and she said uh, they paid her just enough to buy her a new fence for her house. <laughs> That's what she said. But anyway, this fellow, uh, uh, the, the man's name, he actually was an undertaker. The man's name was um, Dillard Darby, Dillard Darby and Sophie Stone. It was Darby's car that was stolen. He and Stone did not know each other. They just chanced to get involved in this. Clyde spotted Darby's car and thought it was kind of a neat looking car and wanted it and asked W.D. Jones, uh, you think you could get that thing going pretty quick? And he said, oh, yeah, I can get that thing going. So, and sure enough, he does. But uh, Darby sees him doing it, comes running out and another one of the jumping on the running board things. But instead of getting shot, W.D. Jones turned a corner really quick and threw him off the car. And then Jones took off sped out of town. This was in Ruston, Louisiana, this happened. Bonnie and Clyde and Buck and Blanche are are in the car trying to catch up with W.D. Jones. And he's driving so fast, he loses them. They can't find him at all, which really makes Clyde mad. He's really, really mad. Then Clyde in his rearview mirror sees this other car coming. And what had happened was after Darby got thrown off it was right near a school and a school teacher saw this and offered to give him a ride to try and get his car back and that was sophie stone so she got her car and the two of them take off after wd jones but they wind up behind bonnie and clyde and clyde spots them and uh suspects who who it is but he's he's trying to find wd jones and and they spend more than an hour looking for wd jones do not find him at all And they keep running across this other car. And so finally, Clyde stops and flags the other car down. He said, "Uh, have you seen uh, this car? And uh, the man, Darby, pretended like he didn't know what he was talking about, because I think Darby suspected who Clyde was. 
uh, that he was part of this this theft of his car. Uh, Darby said, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, Clyde opened up the door and jerked him out, out of the car and, and pulled him around behind the car and then hit him in the back with the butt of his gun and knocked him down and then threw him in their car uh, next to Buck and Blanche. And then Bonnie got out and got Sophie Stone and dragged her back to the car and threw her in with Buck and Blanche. And uh, Sophie Stone said uh, Buck was just full of grease. Uh, they must have been working on a car or something. He's, she said uh, he, he was very, very greasy. Blanche was pretty clean, and Bonnie and Clyde were pretty clean, but Buck was just really, really greasy and really tiny, little tiny people. All these people were real tiny people. And uh, she said in that back seat with Buck and Blanche were all these weapons, all these Browning automatic rifles and forty fives and all this ammunition. But she said none of that scared her as much as the way Clyde Barra drove. He took off like a bat out of hell. He was just flying through towns, and he would take off across fields. He would leave the road and just go blasting across a field and pick up another road someplace else. And then they went all the way into Arkansas and uh, then uh, just stopped and dropped uh, Darby and Stone off and gave them $5 for a bus ride home and then took off. But uh, Sophie Stone says she was scared out of her mind. Oh, at one point they stopped. I remember this. At one point they stopped uh, because it was too crowded in the back seat, and Sophie Stone was brought up to the front seat. And so she's sitting between Bonnie and Clyde, and that's when she really got the full effect of how fast Clyde was driving. These rutted dirt roads, he'd be doing 90, 95, 100 on these rutted, and the car's just vibrating and sliding all over the place. And on those rutted roads, uh, the car was vibrating so much, the glove compartment uh, door would open up frequently. And these magazines for uh, Browning automatic rifles filled with ammunition would fall out onto the floor. While he's still driving, Clyde would reach across and pick them up off the floor and shove them back into the glove box and slam the door. And then it would open up again. And that just scared the heck out of her because he's taking his eye off the road and just flying down this road. Finally, this kept happening, and finally he just picked them all up and dumped them in Sophie Stone's lap and said, here, hold these. (laughs) She did not have a fun time at all. There was no hamburger eating. There were no jokes being told. Uh, However, the the subject of Darby being an undertaker did come up. Bonnie started getting chatty. Clyde was still fuming. He never stopped being mad that whole trip. But Bonnie, yeah, she started uh, getting chatty and wanting to know who these people were. And so uh, uh, she asked Sophie Stone, what do you do? And and uh, she said she taught home economics in school there. And uh, Bonnie said, uh, you mean like cooking things? Yeah. I said, oh, did you cook something today? If you did, describe it to me because I'm so hungry, she said. Then she asked Darby what he did, and uh, he said he was an undertaker. There's a lot of conflict about who said what and what they said. Uh, Some sources say Clyde actually asked, wouldn't you like to embalm me? But three sources, including Clyde's mother's manuscript, said it was Bonnie that asked that question. Uh, Would you like to embalm Clyde and me? They did identify themselves, which was unusual. They usually didn't do that. Uh, they did a, would you like to embalm Clyde and me? And uh, Darby said, no, no, I hope you all live a long time. You know, he was just <laughs> trying to, you know, get, and, and, and apparently Bonnie thought it was funny and started laughing. Said, oh, yeah, you, you'd love to embalm us. But Clyde was not thinking it was funny at all. And it was not long after that he stopped and dumped him out. <laughs> And then drove off. Uh, Sophie Stone said they got dropped off and then the car took off. And they were thinking, oh, good, because they really thought they were going to be killed. But then the car stopped and it backed up a few feet and they thought, oh, no, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. And a five dollar bill sailed out the window and landed on the side of the road. And then the car took off. That was money for the bus ride home there. But there was no love loss in that, that one. And that's usually the way those abductions were. The unusual one was that city marshal, Percy Boyd. 
Well, if we go back to the movie, there is another big shootout that we see. And this, again, the gang is holed up somewhere this time. It's at some cabins in Platte City, Iowa. Blanche and C.W. Moss in the, in the movie grab some chicken dinners for the gang. Uh, someone at the restaurant happens to see a gun. And then so he calls Sheriff Smoot after the two leave. And this leads the law to the cabins where the Barrow gang are spending the night. And this time it's the law that shoots first in the movie. And the shootout is seems to be a lot bigger than the one in Missouri. The law even comes with there's an armored vehicle. And uh, this is where we kind of mentioned earlier that gang mentioned that they had robbed an armory. We see them pulling out grenades and got big machine guns. Uh, but the gang does manage to get away, not before both Bluck and... Uh, I'm sorry, Buck and Blanche are injured, uh, although Buck's injury seems to be a lot worse than Blanche's in the movie. How well did the movie do portraying this shootout in Iowa? Again, the essence of it is is spot on. A, a lot of the details are uh, kind of uh, rearranged or uh, didn't happen. <laughs> uh, but the, the essence of it is there, just like most of the rest of the movie, the essence is there. This particular shootout, Platte City, Missouri, which um, today where the Kansas City International Airport is, one of the runways is right up against where these cabins used to be. They don't exist anymore, but uh, you, you'll go to visit the site and, and there's a, a roadway that's been cut all through there. So it's kind of hard to get a fix on where the place actually was, but um and planes are always flying real low over you <laughs> while you're coming in. But uh, in Platte City, Missouri, this appears to be the first time uh, law enforcement actually thought this was the Barrow Brothers. Uh, and, and that's why all the armaments came out. Uh, that's why there were so many officers involved. The way it's portrayed in the movie, like you said, um, uh, C.W. Moss, who was actually W.D. Jones uh, at this point, and Blanche were, uh, would go into the where the little restaurant was and get food and bring it back to the cabins. Usually it was only Blanche that went out and got anything. Once in a while, W.D. Jones went with her, but usually he stayed out of sight too. No one ever saw Clyde or Buck or Bonnie. And Bonnie was injured at the time. She had been injured in a car wreck and darn near died, actually. But the way that Clyde apparently drives, that's not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He was tooling along in the Texas panhandle and uh, did not notice a sign that said the, the bridge across the South Canadian River had been moved. And he took the old route and, and there was no bridge there. And he just drove right into the South Canadian River. Uh, which was dry at the time. The car overturned and caught fire and uh, burnt W.D. Jones and him uh, bad enough, but darn near completely burnt Bonnie up. She was trapped in the car, and it was only a couple of farmers came and, and uh, helped lift the car so they could pull her out, and by then she had been really severely burned. How she survived that, I have no idea. But Blanche said when she saw the three of them, she thought all three of them were going to die especially Bonnie. So uh, in, in Platte City, uh, Bonnie can't hardly move on her own. She has to be carried everywhere. And so that, that's one reason why nobody ever saw her. And then Clyde and Buck just didn't want to be seen. So mostly Blanche would go out and she always paid with coins, which uh, mildly interested the proprietor there. He thought that was kind of unusual. I don't know why it was unusual, but it must have been because he thought it was kind of unusual. and. There were several other things that, uh, you know, he kept looking at those cabins and uh, there were newspapers covering all the glass, uh, which they had put up. And, and uh, Blanche in her book said she thought that was kind of a bad idea. It kind of really sent a weird message, <laughs> this newspapers in the window. And sure enough, it, it, it did make people suspicious. That, that name, Sheriff Smoot. That cracks me up. That's a kind of a, a nod to the Dallas County Sheriff at the time, Schmoot Schmidt. Uh, but uh, uh, Clarence Coffey was the, the uh, sheriff up in uh, Platte City, uh, Platte County up there. And uh, so he was notified. And 
he actually saw Blanche in town. She was buying medical supplies at the pharmacy for Bonnie, actually. And uh, th that was also kind of weird, people were thinking. And also Blanche was extremely good looking. Uh, she, she was dressed to the nines. She had this great hairstyle and uh, she was Hollywood good looking. You know, you can see it in the photographs. And, and even in old age, she was a really good looking old lady. <laughs> she really was. So uh, th that alone caught everybody's attention. Here's this woman basically from Hollywood walking around Platte City, buying all these medical supplies and paying for everything with coins. And nobody has seen the car. Nobody's seen anybody with her <laughs> except this kid every now and then. So uh, the sheriff starts wondering, who the heck is this? And he starts to suspect it's the Barrow brothers. I can't quite remember how he put all that together, but he was sure right. And he contacted Kansas City, which was not far away, and uh, asked them for some help. They brought this this vehicle out that is often described as an armored car. Uh, locals said it wasn't armored. It was just a, a police vehicle. And, and the way Clyde shot it to pieces, you know, proved it wasn't too armored uh, anyway. But uh, th there was, uh, so there were three buildings, actually. There was um, this main building of the Red Crown Cabins, and the main building had a ballroom and had the offices and had a restaurant. And so Blanche would be seen in there, and uh, uh, occasionally W.D. Jones would be seen in there. And then there was a, a little filling station kind of convenience store across the street from the cabins. And there were only two cabins, so they occupied the whole thing, Bonnie and Clyde and Buck and Blanche and W.D. Jones. And so there's this little convenience store across the street that sold gas, too. W.D. Jones would go across there to get soft drinks. He always bought five soft drinks. The guy in that store is the only one that pegged there were five people in that place. Even 50 years later, locals thought there were four people in the place but when there was five because he he got a really clear look at W.D. Jones because he'd come across there. Uh, one time, uh, uh, it was getting late at night, and the restaurant in the Red Crown had closed. So uh, uh, apparently everybody in the cabins wanted something to eat. So W.D. Jones went to the little convenience store and ordered five sandwiches and five soda pop. And W.D. Jones kept looking over at the Red Crown, uh, the main building. And so the proprietor there looked over too and he noticed all these police cars on the other side of the building and that was the night they were going to surround the cabins and they were hiding the police cars on the other side but they were kind of blended in with a lot of other cars there was a dance in the ballroom that night too so there were a lot of people there and uh but wd jones apparently had spotted those police cars so he he took the sandwiches and went back to the cabins and then uh, the proprietor said uh he saw sheriff coffee uh, with an armor plated thing in front of him uh, walk up to the cabin so he stepped out uh, near the road to take a look at what's going on and sheriff coffee and another man knocked on buck and blanche's door and uh, uh blanche in her book described she heard she and buck heard the knock and blanche said who is it and said it's the police uh, can you send the men out and uh uh, she said, um, oh, we're all asleep. Uh, uh, let me get dressed. And that was actually a signal. Let me get dressed. And she said it loud enough that Clyde and Bonnie and W.D. Jones could hear it in the other cabin. Apparently, Clyde jumped out of bed and grabbed this Browning automatic rifle and just started shooting right through the garage door at Holt Coffee. He hit the uh, shield. Clyde would have been behind Holt Coffee, hit the shield. Uh, th this fellow across the street seeing all of this, he said, all of a sudden, flames about three feet long started flying out of all the windows of those cabins. And a line of bullets raked right in front of him. On, on there, and he decided, I think I'll go back in the building here. So he goes back in the building. His sister's there and his fiance is there. And they actually go up on the roof or where they can get behind some shelter and observe the whole thing from the roof of this convenience store there. 
He said uh, by the time they got up to the roof, several of the police officers had run to hide behind their building and stayed there the whole time. I asked this man, I said, were you surprised by the firepower that, that suddenly erupted? And he said, you darn right I was, and everybody else there was too. There was a state highway patrolman there uh, that night that this fellow knew. And the next day he talked to him and he said he, said he was totally caught off guard. Uh, but they did think it was the Barrow brothers. They just didn't know how, how ferocious these people are. And so uh, Clyde and W.D. Jones and Buck are shooting out all of the windows. And those Browning automatic rifles can go right through brick walls. They're just powerful as can be. Well, one of the slugs penetrated the Red Crown, the main building there, and uh, went into the kitchen through a stove and struck somebody hiding behind that stove there. That's how powerful those things are. And then this vehicle, this police vehicle that's often described as an armored car had been pulled up in front of the garage to try and block the garage. And Clyde started shooting at that thing. And he, he just tore it apart. And he, he hit the driver in the knees. And the driver instantly thought, yeah, I think I'll back out of here. You know, and so he threw it in reverse and he, and he backed up and Clyde's still shooting and uh, Clyde hits the horn and he shorts out the horn and the horn just starts going. Bang! And a lot of the officers took that as a signal to stop shooting. And so the, the officers stopped shooting and that's when Buck and Blanche decided to come out and uh, uh, officers then opened fire on them. They, they actually, they were holding mattresses up like they show in the movie but the garage door was closed. Uh, Clyde and W.D. Jones were trying to load Bonnie into the car in the garage, and uh, they heard the gunfire. And then uh, this time, Blanche does scream. She's screaming above the sound of the uh, gunfire for Clyde to open up the garage door. And the witness across the street that I s spoke with said he, he remembers a woman screaming. And that was Blanche. She, she said she was screaming above the sound of the gunfire to get Clyde to open up the garage door. Clyde opened up the garage door, and by then, Buck had been shot through the head. It was a through-and-through -through shot right through the head. Uh, Blanche was unhurt at that point. Buck fell into Blanche's arms. When he was struck, the, the man across the street saw this. When he was struck, he had started to fire his Browning automatic rifle, and he went back, and, and the uh, barrel went up in the air firing straight up into the air, uh, and then fell back into Blanche's arms. And then Clyde came out, and Clyde uh, reached for Buck and reached for Buck's gun and grabbed it by the barrel and burned the hell out of his hand and dropped the gun right there. Uh, it, just, it was just an accident, that kind of thing. And they loaded him in the car. At this point, uh, Clyde knows Buck's hit, but he doesn't know how serious it is. Load them in the car, and they back the car out. And by this time, all the officers had stopped shooting. Although Blanche uh, told me, she said, it didn't seem like they stopped shooting to me, but uh, everybody else I talked to on the other side said uh, they had stopped shooting because they just kind of wanted them to leave. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing that they were way over, over uh, match uh, with weapons here. The one thing in the movie that they portray, they're, they're using those Thompson machine guns which they used in The Highwaymen also. And I even told the director, I said, nobody was using those things because they jammed really bad. Thompson didn't fix that till World War II came out. The director said, yeah, I know, but they look so good. <laughs> <laughs> I had to be, yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> I mean, they look so good, you know. <laughs> they, I will say they are super recognizable. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, and and it only really matters to somebody like me, you know, and other people like that. But uh, nevertheless, they're, they're in the car and they back out. And the evidence that they were still shooting is that one of the tires was hit. Uh, one or two of the tires was hit as they drove off. And But they kept driving. They kept driving. And they had to stop more than once to fix the tires. In, in fact, until the morning, they never did get out of the area. They were within a few miles of the place the whole night, uh, trying to fix the tires. Trying, and, and, oh, uh, yeah, other evidence that they were still shooting when the car backed out was a line of fire 
raked into the car and glass uh, hit Blanche in the eye, hit her in both eyes. One of her eyes was permanently damaged and a bullet fragment struck her in the forehead uh, just above the hairline. And that was that remained there the rest of her life. But she was blind in one eye and couldn't see real well out of the other eye either uh, because of that glass. That, but uh, she concealed that until later because she didn't want Buck to be upset because he was conscious. He had this through through shot. And he was absolutely conscious. Uh, uh, she said the the floorboard in the back seat was just you know about an inch of blood down there. It was just. It, it wasn't until they were trying to uh, change one of the tires just a few miles from the shootout uh, that Clyde came to realize Blanche was injured too. Uh, he, he he didn't realize it till then. So it took them all night to get out of the area there. But uh, that's the way that that story went. They the only reason why they got out of there was uh, uh, because they had superior firepower. Well, you do see them get out in the movie, but then afterwards they're they're in a field out there when the law catches up to them, and again it's another shootout. This time, I think Clyde is hitting the arm as they're trying to escape. There's a ton of gunfire. They're they're driving around. It almost looks like Clyde is trying to go one direction, and then there's gunfire there, so he goes another direction. It's like like they're basically completely surrounded. This is when we see Buck die. We see Buck and Blanche. I think Blanche is captured. Buck dies. Seems to die there, right there. We don't actually we don't really see him die, but you know, camera kind of zooms in on his hand and it's twitching, and then it stops. So you get the impression that that he didn't make it. But then we do see that Bonnie, Clyde, and in this case in the movie, C.W. Moss, get away from there as everybody is kind of converging on, on Buck and Blanche. How well did the movie do showing that? The chaos of it is pretty spot on. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, Clyde, Jones, and Bonnie got away, that, that's, that's right. Um, uh, Buck and Blanche were captured. Uh, Buck lasted six days and died uh, six days later. Uh, and he was apparently in and out of consciousness, uh, pretty coherent all, all the way to the end. And, and he was he had been shot there, too. In addition to the through and through shot in Platte City, he was shot in the back in this Iowa gunfight. And uh, he complained more about that than the than the head shot, you know. Uh, but Blanche, who was having great difficulty seeing, she just stayed with him. One thing about the movie, though, you, you would think the whole Eighth Army had shown up uh, for this, but th- there were only six officers that were involved in this thing. In the uh, Great Depression, there weren't that many officers around. Not a lot of states had state police. In 1934, the year Bonnie and Clyde were killed, uh, the Texas State uh, Highway Patrol was only two years old. Uh, that kind of statewide uh, entity uh, was kind of a new thing in most places. There just weren't that many lawmen. Uh, a lot of people uh, would be volunteers and, and and that sort of thing. There was a crowd there, though. It had become pretty well known in the area that there were these outlaws that, that uh, the local law were going to try and descend upon here. And so sort of like on a Saturday night date, you know, everybody was going out to watch the outlaws get captured. And uh, a lot of them wish they hadn't gone out there because the the gunfight was pretty ferocious. Apparently, W.D. Jones spotted the officers walking toward them. It was just after daybreak. And uh, Clyde grabbed a Browning automatic rifle and just opened up on them. He either deliberately or accidentally aimed high, and he was sawing these tree limbs off these trees, and, and they were falling on these on the officers, and so they were all ducking for cover, and then uh, that gave them enough chance to load into a car. They had two cars, uh, Bunning. They had stolen one from Perry, uh, Iowa, there, and brought it down, uh, and then they had the car from Platte City that was just completely shot up, just completely. But they still had that car. But they they loaded into the Perry car, the newer Perry car, and uh, the officers went for the tires there and knocked it out of commission, and so the Bonnie and Clyde and everybody loaded into the old car to try and take off. And, and Clyde by then had been shot in the shoulder. W. D. Jones had been shot. Bonnie had been shot twice in the stomach. Uh, 
Uh, Buck had been shot in the back. Uh, Blanche somehow avoided getting shot, but they all loaded into the Platte City car. Clyde, because his shoulder wasn't operated, he, he steered the car over a tree stump and got it stuck. And so they all just dove out of the car and headed up this fence line toward the South Raccoon River is where they were going. And somehow they got separated, probably because Buck just couldn't keep up. And uh, Blanche stayed with him. And finally, she found this this uh, large tree that had been felled. And she and Buck hid behind the stump of this tree all morning. And uh, sporadically, she would hear gunfire here and there. In the meantime, Jones and Clyde and Bonnie took off and made it to the South Raccoon River, and they swam across. In the movie, they portray that uh, Bonnie gets shot uh, swimming across the river, but the shooting was long over by then. And Bonnie had already been shot, but she was shot in the abdomen, actually twice in the abdomen, in addition to this uh, burn that she was recovering from. And uh, Clyde shot in the shoulder, and uh, W.D. Jones is shot. There was a man across the river, a farmer uh, named Feller. He was 19 years old at the time. He said he was down in the field there when all of a sudden this, this man covered in blood holding a forty-five was standing in front of him. Uh, said, have you got a car? And uh, he said, yeah. But he didn't have a chance to say that the cars didn't work. Well, one of them worked, but not too well. But anyway, he was so flabbergasted by this guy covered in blood. And then uh, the guy turned around and whistled. And W.D. Jones came through a fence carrying Bonnie. And Bonnie was just totally red in blood. And uh, W.D. Jones was covered in blood. And the three of them walked up to the farmhouse. And... uh, the first car they come to is up on blocks and Clyde gets pissed and, and says, uh, I thought you said you had a car. Well, yeah, we do have a car. I didn't say it worked. You know, you didn't give me a chance, but, uh, uh, then there was, there was this other car and I forgot what make it was, but it was, it was not one that Clyde was familiar with. It may have been an older model of a make that he was on. Anyway, he got in the car, and W.D. Jones and Bonnie got in the back seat, and uh, he couldn't figure out how to start the thing. So this kid, uh, he uh, leans into the window past Clyde to show him where the ignition was and how the gears work, and he said that forty five was just sitting on that seat there. Clyde had set that forty five down. And he said the thought just briefly crossed his mind to grab that forty five and take off. <laughs> so I was interviewing this fella, and uh, I said, did you know that forty five didn't have any ammunition in it? And he said, no, I, I wouldn't have gone through with it anyway. <laughs> yeah, probably that would not be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, Cl- Clyde had bluffed his way in there. He was completely out of ammunition, which was kind of unusual for Clyde Barrow. He had shot everything. Uh, he only had that 145. They left all the weapons, uh, all the Browning automatic rifles, every all the 45 or 50 Colt 45 automatic pistols, uh, several thousand rounds of ammunition, all back at that campsite. Uh, before that happened, what led up to that? They were there for five days at that campsite, and uh, the campsite was at an old abandoned amusement park, actually. Uh, it was an amusement park uh, called Dexfield Park, and it was between Redfield and Dexter, Iowa. And it had gone bust in the Depression. So there was a baseball field, uh, the remnant of old swimming pool, and uh, other equipment all around. But the uh, uh, loggers were in there frequently cutting timber, and that's mostly what was happening there. It was a, a source of timber in the area. So uh, th- they had camped near the timber line and somebody was out walking his dog and noticed these this car with all these bullet holes in it never saw any people but just saw this car with these bullet holes so he reported that to the local police in the meantime there was this uh, there's a pharmacy in in dexter iowa 
and a restaurant. And the restaurant was Bloom's Restaurant. And I, I spoke to one of the owners, Ms. Bloom, and she remembered this very well-dressed, and, and the way she put it was, very good-looking young man came in there every day and ordered five chicken dinners. And the first time he came in, he ordered the five chicken dinners, and uh, she brought out the order, and he said, uh, what about plates and silverware? And she said, oh, you need that too? And he said, yeah. And all they had was china and real silver. And, and she gave it to him. And he, she said he brought it back every time. Every time he brought it back. Of course, he didn't want to call attention to himself, but he already had. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the car, the car with bullet holes, that kind of does it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it, it, by then they'd stolen this new car from Perry. And Ms. Bloom says she remembers a woman always sitting in the car. And that, that probably was Bonnie. She would ride with him. Buck and Blanche and W.D. Jones were back at the campsite. And so the five chicken dinners. So uh, Buck was uh, doing well enough to eat. You know, uh, he could move very slowly on his own. It was very, very uh, interesting, his injury there. But uh, five, for four or five days, uh, here he comes. And she said everybody in the restaurant would hold their breath when he'd walk in because everybody knew he was some kind of outlaw. N nobody looked like him in, in her experience. Nobody, she had never seen anybody that looked like this guy and acted like this guy. He was always looking over his shoulder. And, and he was always uh, feeling under his coat <laughs> when she, she and everybody uh, was it was like everybody was holding their breath until he left. And then, then after he left and then everybody would be talking about this strange man and this woman who came every day. And then occasionally he'd go over to the pharmacy and buy a bunch of pharmaceutical items, you know, and that was mostly for Buck and fix him up. But I, I never forget, she said, very nice looking man. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, he always brought the silverware back. Always brought the china and silverware back. Yeah, so that was that was that that thing. Now uh, after that, they got that car across the river and they drove to Nebraska, and uh, they actually had to steal some sheets from a, a line at somebody's house. They had uh, sheets out drying on the line. They stole some sheets and poked holes through them to stick their heads through because their clothes were so bloody. They didn't want people to look in the car and see all these bloody people in the car. They sort of looked like ghosts, the way W.D. Jones put it. They kind of looked like ghosts inside there. But it, it wasn't long after that. They, they Somehow they started to recover. Jones had been wounded, but not as bad as Bonnie and uh, Clyde. Uh, Jones said their technique was they'd hang around a hospital. And they'd wait for a doctor to leave. And then they'd follow the doctor home. And then they'd steal the doctor's car because his bag would be in the car. And then they'd leave the car and, and keep the bag. So they always had all these this medical equipment, including all kinds of painkillers and everything. In fact, Bonnie got hooked on painkillers because of that burn. And uh, Clyde made her uh, go cold turkey off of it. Uh, he, he hated that kind of thing. He didn't even like coffee. He didn't like and he didn't like drinking the beer with Buck, but he would because it was his brother. But he didn't like any kind of stimulus or depressant at all. And Bonnie got super hooked. And uh, when that happened after that burn, that it was one of the extenuating circumstances that caused friction between she and Blanche because uh, Bonnie was just grumpy anyway, coming off off his painkillers. And uh, she and Blanche kind of had this rivalry anyway. And so that kind of exacerbated that, that thing. But uh, they, they slowly recovered uh, over the rest of the summer. And uh, sometime in August, they were in Mississippi. And uh, Clyde put Jones out to steal another car. And, and Jones stole the car and drove back to Texas. And he didn't want to have anything more to do with Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, Clyde didn't pursue it. Uh, he figured, yeah, he's 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 done enough. <laughs> he's done enough, you know. And Clyde had always told Jones also, if you ever get arrested, tell him anything you want. I don't care. I understand. Tell him anything you want. So uh, W.D. Jones made up all this crap about Clyde tying him up at night and stuff like that. And it, and it was all 
just to keep the law from coming down on him. So yeah, it was that shootout, yeah. This is when we see, at least in the movie, C.W. Moss. Well, I guess it's actually, we see a brief scene where Frank Hamer is in town and he talks to C.W.'s father, Ivan Moss. And then we see Ivan telling his son not to get back in the car with Bonnie and Clyde after they go into town the next day. And then the reason that we see in the movie showing the two leaving CW in town is because there's a sheriff that parks next to Bonnie and Clyde at the store. And so they decide to leave without their friend. Don't worry, we're going to come back in 20 minutes and and get him. How well did the movie do showing the events that were leading up to the ambush? Actually, this is where the movie gets kind of off the mark uh, because they left out the main ingredient that actually leads to the ambush. And that was the raid of the prison farm, East Ham in Texas. That's what actually put into motion all the events that led to the ambush over in Louisiana, because it was the uh, general manager of the Texas prison system that hired Frank Hamer. And this, of course, comes out in the highwayman. Uh, We've got the general manager of the Texas prison system, Lee, Lee Simmons, who hires Frank Hamer to, as Lee Simmons in his own book said, he's, these are his words. I told Frank Hamer, put Clyde and Bonnie on the spot and shoot everyone in sight. That's his own words in his own book. <laughs> well, like you were saying, they're not going to take him captive. No, it was, it was an execution. And to Hamer's credit, uh, he asked if he, he couldn't, you know, modify that a bit and just hone in on Bonnie and Clyde and not try and shoot everyone in sight. Oh, they, they wanted to shoot every, the entire gang, not just Bonnie and Clyde, but anybody that was there. Just anybody that was there. Yeah, just any, anybody that was there. Hamer wanted to focus uh, really on Clyde, actually. He wasn't all that interested in Bonnie. Nobody was really that interested in Bonnie. She wasn't that big a target. Uh, uh, everyone uh, that I ever spoke to thought that if Bonnie had been taken alive, she would have rehabilitated and gone straight and straight as can be. It was uh, 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 Clyde was the one that was never going to change. Uh, e- everybody I ever talked to that knew him said he was never going to give up alive. It, they were going to have to kill him. And he had said that more than once. Of course, a lot of outlaws say that kind of thing. But uh, after, what was it, nine police officers are killed, you know, they started to take him seriously. Yeah, so the raid on East Ham in January 1934, that sets off the chain of events that leads to the ambush over in Louisiana. Uh, One of the guards was killed in that. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde had engineered this raid, and uh, four life criminals were, were released there, including Raymond Hamilton. And this fellow, Henry Methven, he was one of them that was released there. Clyde had known Henry Methven, and Joe Palmer was another one. And, of course, he definitely knew Raymond Hamilton. But he'd know, uh, Clyde had known Joe Palmer and Henry Methven when he was there at East Ham in prison. So they were all in on this, this raid that had actually been planned for a couple of years. And it just took that long to pull it off. And so they pulled it off, and it uh, greatly embarrassed uh, the Texas prison system, and especially the general manager, Lee Simmons. Lee Simmons had been brought on as general manager to stop all the escapes from Texas prisons. I mean, there were were whole squads of (laughs) prisoners that were literally just walking off the prison farms. You know, it, it was that bad. And uh, he initiated all these really nasty programs to uh, suppress that. And, and Clyde was caught up in some of those nasty programs. And, it, and uh, Clyde was one. Um, his sister, Marie, uh, told me that the breakdown of the kids, uh, of, of Clyde and his siblings, was about half and half. About half of them, when they got mad, that was it. It was over with. And Buck was one of those. But Buck could get really, really mad and very vicious. But as soon as he got it out, that was it. It, it, it never came out. But the other half of the siblings, including Clyde, if he got mad, never forgot it. Never forgot it. So, uh, And Clyde was a bit of a control freak. So you can imagine what it's like for a control freak to be in prison and then to suffer under a regime that used torture and all kinds of nasty things. 
Uh, so Clyde conceived of this idea of going to East Dam, and in his words, I'd like to turn everybody loose and shoot every damn one of these guards. That, that, that's what his plan was from the start. So uh, it, it, he and Bonnie raid uh, Easton Prison Farm with the help of a couple of other people there, and these uh, four convicts escape. And uh, that's when this uh, spree of bank robberies takes place to get enough money to pay off one of the ones that helped pull off the raid there. And then once that is over, uh, Clyde's finished with bank robberies. And most of the other outlaws that escaped with them had gone off on their own, but Henry Muffin stayed with them. And uh, Henry Muffin winds up being involved in a double murder on Easter Sunday of two Texas Highway patrolmen. And then six days later, this uh, constable up in Oklahoma, uh, which includes the abduction of Percy Boyd, who came to have this great admiration for Clyde Barrow, and kind of like uh, Bonnie, they abducted him and left him in Missouri there. So in a short period of six days, Henry Methen's involved in three murders. Uh, his family is trying to figure out a way to get him away from Bonnie and Clyde and how to deal with these murders he's now involved with. And they conceive of this idea to um, offer up Bonnie and Clyde in exchange for a pardon for Henry. And uh, the governor, Miriam uh, Ferguson, goes along with it. Uh, they're over in Louisiana. The Methvin family finds a man named John Joyner who knows the sheriff of that, that parish there and asks this man, Joyner, to be the go-between so that there's no face-to-face between the Methvins and the sheriff, so there's no suspicion because Clyde Barrow is really dangerous, a really dangerous little character, and very suspicious, always was suspicious. So this John Joyner started going between the sheriff there and the Methans. And the Methans said, uh, we want some kind of written deal for Henry. And so the sheriff, and, and uh, by this time, the FBI is involved too. There's a, an agent from New Orleans named Lester Kendall who's involved in this. And also Frank Hamer has shown up in Louisiana. That's a, in, in the movie Highwaymen, they have him chasing Clyde all over the place, but he went straight to Louisiana, which, which would be the logical thing to do. He was from Louisiana. Let's go find him in Louisiana. He's going to go home eventually. And so uh, Hamer's there, Lester Kendall's there with uh, the sheriff, Henderson Jordan, with this John Joyner, and uh, uh, the sheriff writes up this handwritten deal that uh, offers clemency for Henry. And Hamer takes it back to Austin, and uh, Ferguson, the governor, signs off on it. And uh, Hamer takes the thing back to Louisiana, and Sheriff Jordan keeps it in his office there. And so the deal is underway. This is in February 1934. Because of the nature of Bonnie and Clyde and how they operate, it's hard to pinpoint where they're going to be. They they ranged from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. And as far east as the Atlantic Ocean, as far west as the Rocky Mountains that we know of. So, And it was nothing for Barrow to drive 1,200 miles in a day and then turn right around and go back again the same way. Just to give you an idea how much this guy traveled, the car he was killed in was stolen two weeks before the ambush, and it was brand new. It had 100 miles on it, and, and it had 7,500 miles on it two weeks later. That's how much this guy drove. He drove that much. So uh, uh, this deal is underway, and in the meantime, Henry gets himself in these three murders. You can see the way it's reported that there's this concerted effort to keep the fact that there's this third person involved (laughs) out of this. Uh, You look at the newspaper reports and and what what the uh, law enforcement is feeding to the newspaper. They go out of their way to conceal that there's a third person with Bonnie and Clyde uh, because this third person is the one that's that's involved in these these shootings. And it's Henry Methvin, and the governor does (laughs) a lot. It, he's already made this deal to pardon this guy, and now he's got three murders under his belt. 
So uh, uh, everything gets uh, blamed on Bonnie and Clyde. Of course, they're very culpable. But nothing is ever mentioned about Henry Methan except by accident. <laughs> except by accident. For instance, the Dallas Morning News, after the double murder of these uh, Texas Highway Patrolmen, Dallas Morning News makes a big deal about this fingerprint found on a whiskey bottle at the scene, that it was Clyde Barrow's thumbprint, actually, on there. And that's on the headlines of the Dallas Morning News and the Daily Times Herald and but over in Fort Worth, where the actual fingerprint expert was, because that's in Tarrant County where they were killed, the Fort Worth paper uh, prints that the thumbprint is Henry Methvin's. And that's the only time you see the name Henry Methvin. It gets suppressed after that. You can, you can imagine what uh, Governor Ferguson's thinking. Oh, man, I've made this deal with this guy, and now he's shooting at the state. Oh, man. So uh, she's she's after Hamer to hurry up and get this get this job done. So, so anyway, so uh, by this time, uh, Bob Alcorn from Dallas County and Ted Hinton are out there looking for Bonnie and Clyde too, and they keep coming across Hamer, so they join forces. And then Hamer decides to uh, get a partner too, and he gets his colleague uh, Manny Galt to come along with him, and then Henderson Jordan and his deputy, and that makes the six. Uh, people there. They encounter Bonnie and Clyde frequently over there in Louisiana. Um, uh, one time Ted Hinton says they're driving on the road and uh, Barra passed them. And of course, uh, Hammer's behind the wheel and he doesn't know uh, because he doesn't know what they look like. And uh, Hinton and Alcorn said, there they go right there. And, and by the time they turned around, he was gone. He was out of there. And then uh, this family, uh, Methan's mother and father, they were so destitute, they were actually living in a tent at the time in this town called Castor in a public park in the middle of Castor. And uh, this is where the six officers had this plan to try and take Bonnie and Clyde there in the middle of Castor. But it was in a different parish, and that particular sheriff was on the take and what couldn't be trusted, and it's possible that, that Clyde was paying him off to be able to stay there. So they, they got the Methans to move into Henderson Jordan's parish, into this abandoned farmhouse, and uh, uh, set up business there. And somehow uh, it all escaped the scrutiny of Clyde. Uh, Clyde's usually really suspicious of things like that. And Clyde certainly wouldn't have known this sheriff in, in Benville Parish, this Henderson Jordan. It, it, I'm kind of surprised Clyde went along with it. I don't know what the details were about how they convinced Clyde this was a good idea, but th they moved into a different parish there so that they have a better shot at them and not in some public place where somebody else could get hurt. But more importantly, there would be witnesses to what they're going to do. So then uh, uh, much of the rest of the movies pretty spot on. Uh, Old Man Methan has this truck. It, ironically, it's a truck that Clyde bought for him uh, as a cover. Clyde was supposed to be uh, a lumberjack. <laughs> and everybody I spoke to in Benville Parish that remembered them said, this, everybody knew this guy wasn't a lumberjack. Nobody, no lumberjack they ever knew drove around in brand new Ford V8s with silk shirts and diamond tie pins and stuff. They knew this guy was some kind of outlaw. They didn't know Bonnie and Clyde, but they, they knew this guy was somebody else. <laughs> but anyway, that was the cover. Uh, the old man had this truck, and of course, that was the perfect decoy. Because how on earth are you going to get somebody like Clyde Barrow to stop long enough to get yourself shot? And the idea was, well, make it look like a truck broke down way out on this, this back road. So that's what they did, uh, and they were very clever about it. Uh, the officers set up this blind on one side of the road, just like they show in the movie. And uh, it, it's on the east side of the road, and the truck is parked facing north on the, on the west side of the road, meaning that as Clyde approached from the north, he'd have to pull into the oncoming lane to get up next to that truck or to pass that truck, which would put him real close to the ambush team. And also because 
Clyde would know that truck, he'd probably be looking at that truck and not at the officers that were uh, on the other side. And then Henry's father, Ivy, was supposed to be out of the truck like like the truck had broken down. He took a wheel off the truck and had it land there on the ground. And that, of course, did the trick. Uh, Clyde stopped and asked, uh, you know, started talking to him. And according to uh, court transcripts, there was a signal uh, because uh, only Ted Hinton and Bob Alcorn knew what Bonnie and Clyde looked like. But, of course, Henry uh, I- Ivy Methan uh, really knew what they looked like. So Alcorn and Hinton, they would get idea if they could, but if there was some issue, then uh, old man Methan, the signal was uh, Methan was to act like maybe he was starting to get sick to his stomach and hold his stomach and run off into the trees like he was going to throw up. And that was the signal, yeah, this is them. So he, he did that, apparently, ran off into the trees. Bonnie and Clyde are looking toward him and toward the truck away from the officers. And, and they portray this in the movie a, a little bit differently. They have Clyde get out of the car in the movie, which he never did get out of the car, which would be natural for him. Even if he knew somebody, he wouldn't get out of the car unless he felt real comfortable about it. And it appears he had the car shifted into first. It was a standard transmission, so he had the clutch depressed, and it was shifted into first so he could get out of there real quick if he had to. And he's just waiting there. Well, apparently one of the six officers, the deputy, was so nervous he jumped up before the signal was given, and he fired off two shots. And Ted Hinton said he saw Clyde's head snap back. So Clyde was probably killed right there. But uh, the jig was up then, and so uh, everybody else got up and just opened up on that car because they wanted to make sure they got this guy because he was really scary, <laughs> this guy was. And uh, so what happened was when, when he was hit there, Apparently, he had this thing shifted into first with the clutch depressed. And when he was hit, he let the clutch go and the car goes rolling off down the road. And uh, Ted Hinton said his first thought was, my gosh, he's getting away. How how does the car is full of bullet holes and they're still shooting at him and the car is rolling off down the road. But then it just kind of eased up against an embankment and stopped. And they knew they finally had him there. McLeod never got out of the car. But the uh, the movie does portray the old truck and the wheel off of the truck as the decoy and the blind that the officers had, had uh, built there to conceal themselves. Of course, the weapons are all wrong, <laughs> but, you know, that's 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 neither here nor there. Uh, but uh, it, the way it's portrayed in the movie, it's a beautiful moment because there's this moment between Clyde and Bonnie which never happened. They didn't have time for that. Apparently, um, by two different accounts, apparently Bonnie may have seen uh, uh, the deputy standing up because she screamed. She must have seen something just before those first two shots, and then then everybody opened up. I spoke with uh, two farmers who were working nearby in the fields, and uh, one of the farmers was familiar with dynamite because he used it to blow tree stumps. And he said uh, he distinctly remembers hearing two shots and then what he thought was dynamite going off. That, that was how powerful the sound was. Just when they all opened up. Yeah, when they all opened up. And then he, he walked over to see see what was going on. And the road was just full of smoke. You know, that was back before smokeless tobacco. I mean, not <laughs> That was back uh, before smokeless gunpowder. And uh, even Ted Hinton described it it took several minutes for the air to clear before they could actually see anything, you know, because the the smoke was so thick. They had unleashed so, so much gunpowder. I wanted to ask, because I know you've you've talked to members of the Barrow Gang, like you mentioned earlier, uh, Blanche Barrow getting to see herself portrayed in the movie, but you've also talked to Ralph Fultz. Did they ever talk more about the movie and how it was? Ralph said uh, he went to see the movie because he, he, when it first came out and he said from, from the moment it started, he, he couldn't figure out what was going on. He said he didn't, he didn't recognize anybody in that movie. 
And then, then when uh, the, one of the parts we've talked about already, when uh, Bonnie and Clyde coerced the kid at the at the filling station to join them, Ralph said, "You don't walk up to a stranger and say we rob banks." <laughs> That we wouldn't have lasted two weeks if we were broadcasting things like that around to perfect strangers. <laughs> so he was he was absolutely flabbergasted by the movie. But it, you know, I often think about this. Imagine a producer and a director making a movie of your life. Uh, how much of it do you suppose you'd actually recognize? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's your life through someone else's eyes, and it's it, it's always the way it is, you know. But uh, nevertheless, there's so much evidence. I don't I don't know why uh, writers and directors feel like they have to take an absolutely uh, exciting, very true story and alter it at all. I don't know why. I don't know why. Nevertheless, I really like that that '67 movie a lot. I like the performances and I like the writing, even though it's not historically accurate. And man, the cinematography is fantastic. That cinematographer, it, you know, he did um, All the King's Men and uh, Here to Eternity. Uh, he, he's a big deal. And he just made that movie look so rich. It's a great movie. I like it. It's just not historically accurate. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on a chat about Bonnie and Clyde. I know I mentioned Ralph Fulton and Blanche Barrow as well. You've got a book called Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The 10 Fast Years of Ralph Fultz. And you also edited Blanche's memoir called My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, so let's say that this is the this first time that someone has heard the real story of Bonnie and Clyde. Which of your books would you recommend that they start with to learn more? Well, uh, it depends on the viewpoint. Uh, if, if you want a real intense look at the most intense three months of Bonnie and Clyde, go with the Blanche book because she puts you in the car with them and she's very descriptive. She didn't pull many punches. She pulls uh, the, the punches she pulls is with Buck mostly and you can usually see through those, but she doesn't pull any punches with herself or with Bonnie and Clyde really. Um, uh, and, and then if you want the larger picture uh, that includes those three months that starts before Bonnie met Clyde and continues well after they're killed, uh, that's running with Bonnie and Clyde, 10 past years of Ralph Fultz, which includes the uh, only successful escape from the Texas death house that ever occurred. And that's when Raymond Hamilton broke out of that place. Thank you again so much for your time, John. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank John Neal Phillips once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 1967's Bonnie and Clyde. If you want to learn even more about the real Bonnie and Clyde, go check out John's excellent books, Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The Fast 10 Years of Ralph Fultz, and My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. As always, you can find links to those books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story, podcast.com. And while you're there, if you haven't listened to John talking about the laws side of things in The Highwaymen, make sure to do that. He was so much fun to talk to, and I certainly learned a ton from him. I hope that you did too. Speaking of being fun to talk to, at the beginning of this episode, I introduced him as the Emperor of the Western World. <laughs> to give you a little peek behind the podcast, before I hit record with the guest, I always like to verify their title and how they would like me to introduce them on the episode. Both times I've talked to John, he has joked around saying he's trying to get the title Emperor of the Western World off the ground. So I told him I would actually include it in the episode. I don't think he was serious about having me actually include it in the episode, but I thought it was too funny not to. <laughs> Plus, it helps show what a great personality John has. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Clyde always drove carefully so he wouldn't draw the attention of the police. Number two, around the time of the ambush, Clyde's cover in Louisiana was as a lumberjack. Number three, Bonnie and Clyde's favorite weapon of choice was the Browning automatic rifle. 
Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Clyde always drove carefully so he wouldn't draw the attention of the police. That's the lie. When John talked to Sophie Stone about the time that she was kidnapped by Bonnie and Clyde, she told him the thing that scared her the most wasn't the large amount of weapons that she saw in the car. It was Clyde's driving. He would go off the road and drive across fields and drive 90, 95, 100 miles an hour on rutted dirt roads that just made the whole car vibrate. Well, that's just one example, John also told us about how the car Bonnie and Clyde were ambushed in had just 100 miles on it when they stole it. And then two weeks later, it had 7,500 miles or so on it. Then there's the story John told us about how Clyde didn't notice the sign that a bridge had moved and wrecked the car so bad that it flipped, caught fire, and nearly killed Bonnie. So Clyde drove a lot, but I think it's safe to say he was not the most careful driver. That means number two is true. Around the time of the ambush, Clyde's cover in Louisiana was as a lumberjack. As we learned from John, the ambush worked in part because the truck that Ivy Methvin used to pretend he needed help with on the side of the road was one that Clyde had purchased for Ivy as part of the cover of being a lumberjack. Of course, we also learned that no one in Bienville Parish believed that Clyde was actually a lumberjack, but still, that was the story. And number three is also true. Bonnie and Clyde's favorite weapon of choice was the Browning automatic rifle. Even though we see the Barrel Gang using the Thompson machine gun a lot in the movie, John pointed out that at that time, prior to World War II, the Thompson machine gun wasn't very reliable. So in reality, Bonnie and Clyde preferred the Browning automatic rifle, also known as the BAR. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. My hope in sharing this information is to go beyond my podcast, and hopefully you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. Of course, I only have the stats for my show. So with that said, today's episode took a total of 43 hours to create. And as I always do, I want to make it clear, that's only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 43 hours does not include any of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, email, newsletter, social media, and all those other little things outside creating a single podcast episode that are still required to make a podcast. All those things take time to set up and maintain and cost money that goes beyond things associated with this one episode. But they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, then there wouldn't be any episodes based on a true story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you found value in today's episode, and if you're using a Podcast 2.0 app, I'd really appreciate it if you boost now. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed today's episode enough to share it with a friend. And maybe even consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.